Hi, I'm Simon Rohrer from Saxobank, and I'm going to talk about uh, modern enterprise architecture and architecting for outcomes. So right now I'm working here in Copenhagen for Saxobank. I've been here for four and a half years. Um, I am head of enterprise technology architecture and ways of working. Before that, I was at Barclays in London for 15 years. I had a, a few roles. Uh, the last one was as a director in the Ways of Working team. Um, and then there I was working with John Smart, John Berend, and Miles Ogilvy. And John was really kind enough to ask uh, me to contribute a chapter to the IT Revolution Press, Sooner, Safer, Happier. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that today as well. So what I'm gonna talk about is in the context of uh, modern enterprise and what I would characterize in modern enterprise as is um, something at a reasonable scale, teams of teams of teams. Um, and 150 is an interesting number called the Dunbar number. So this is in that context. Um, I'm gonna talk about enterprises that interact with their customers digitally. And I think that's a huge majority of modern enterprises um, where change is a constant. Again, I think this is nearly everywhere, if not everywhere. Um, and in a heterogeneous environment, what I mean there is a combination of uh, old and new systems and processes, large and small ones, slow and fast paces of change, maybe some monoliths, maybe some vendors, maybe some distributed systems and, and some internal ones too. And again, like the teams of teams of teams, we've got systems of systems of systems. So uh, a question really in the context of architecture in particular is what are you optimizing for? What are those trade-offs you're, you're making and um, serving? So an anti-pattern we've seen is that people are optimizing for an enterprise architecture functions are optimizing for things like avoiding duplication, predictive planning and reducing cost. And maybe some of these are good things, but they're not really the sort of business outcomes you should be looking for. Some newer ones, things like uh, cloud, great, we're going all the way to cloud or to Kubernetes, or we're, we're just refactoring everything to microservices. Again, potentially good interim outputs, but they're not outcomes. They're not really business outcomes. What we say in the book, Sooner Safer Happier, is well, the optimized um, outcomes are better value, sooner, safer, happier. And what we're talking about here is better, meaning quality, sooner, meaning uh, flow, time to value or time to learning. Safer is agile, not fragile, security, privacy, minimum viable compliance. And happier is not just happier customers, they're awesome, happier colleagues too, happier citizens and happier climate, um, not happier at uh, any cost. And then finally, value is the thing that makes you special. And we would recommend measuring that in particular in, in terms of objectives and key results. Um, the way we have seen high performing organizations um, change to deliver uh, technology uh, optimally um, has changed a lot in the last few decades. Um, in the 2000s and before that, uh, it was standard practice to have silos, to have a team doing planning, a team doing coding, a team thrown over the wall doing testing, um, then to release and then to operate. Um, and we've learned a lot since uh, the 1990s and 2000s. Um, and now, certainly high-performing organizations do things differently. They do things at pace. They realize that uh, everything is, is in this infinity loop, sometimes called the DevOps loop. Um, and we can, we can make changes in days or hours or maybe even minutes if we're super fast. Um, and we don't have silos. We have a team, uh, a development operations team, a DevOps team, uh, and you build it and you run it. But uh, what we've seen is many architecture departments still think things work uh, in the way on the left rather than the thing uh, rather than the way on the right. So uh, an approach to modern enterprise architecture is needed to, to shift to shift right. An anti-pattern we have seen is just taking uh, agile and DevOps and scaling it to manage dependencies. Um, Jim Kim um, adapts a quote from Winston Churchill. Uh, and he says, we shape our architectures and thereafter they shape us, effectively saying that um, we build architectures to one way uh, of, of building and, and then they become a constraint because architectures can be hard to change. Uh, here's a, a picture um, from a, a book on simplifying enterprise architectures that shows a, a typical, typical legacy 
system or system of systems with everything talking to everything else, databases on the bottom, technical services in the middle, business services or um, client-facing user interfaces on the top, and just a, a, a effectively a distributed monolith, a distributed big ball of mud. And in this sort of tightly coupled complex architecture, it's hard to build even the simplest functionality like Hello World, where you have an idea on the left, you want to take that to some uh, cache on the right, um, but you end up having to talk to a number of teams because you've got a number of layers because somebody thought that was a good way to uh, architect all the systems in your organization. And then you need to get some solution architects in the middle to work out which bit of your even fairly simple idea goes where. So the solution architects distribute the work to the different teams. And then the teams eventually, after a few months of coordination, maybe that got into PI planning that quarter, they end up with something that looks a bit like the idea is close enough the world, um, uh, they throw that to a testing team who put all the things together and then eventually uh, you get to put something in front of the customer and ideally make some cash. Um, and a sort of modern way of managing those dependencies is to wrap it in something like an art agile release train or a tribe or a value stream. Uh, and that's far from optimal. So the, the pattern, the, the contrast to the anti-pattern is to minimize dependencies um, and to use architecture for doing that. Don't just manage them and align value and people and technology. So Roger Sessions, um, a writer on enterprise architecture, came up with this idea of software fortresses back in 2002. The name changed a few times since then, but again, this book, Simple Architectures for Complex Enterprises, says that wrap, um, wrap software that is to do with a domain uh, in a fortress. Have some interfaces in, have some interfaces out, um, but leave a team uh, to own that. So ideally, you then refactor your enterprise architecture rather than refactoring sort of low level um, individual pieces of software, you're refactoring your enterprise architecture to be simpler. You now have three teams, three pieces of software, and ideally three domains uh, that do talk to each other, but talk to each other in a relatively simplified way. And the modern way of looking at this is, well, this is a, a loop. The team can release independently. They can develop independently. They've got a, an independent piece of value. Uh, and these ideas, are, and they're, they're not that new. So modular design from the early 70s, structured design from the late 70s, software fortresses, which evolved into the snowman architecture. Eric Evans writing on domain-driven design, um, the 10 deploys a day movement at Flickr that became DevOps, uh, the idea around microservices, uh, Dan North's concept of software that fits in your head. And all of these preceded by Conway's law, Conway's observation that uh, organization was, um, uh, drives architecture. Um, and then probably most recently is the book on team topologies, which is which is a book about architecture as much as it is a book about organizations. So refactoring that hello world idea we had before, well, we can give that to an entire team. We need to refactor the software to do that, but the, the, the team can have something that implements hello world very optimally and then changes to that just go to one team you don't need uh, solution architects to the left you don't need uh, a separate testing team to the right you have this empowered team an autonomous team you've had to refactor both the organization and the architecture there's two things effectively a socio-technical rather than a technical refactoring but um, this thing that has come to be be called microservices again to so the modular teams, modular architectures, you, you can end up with a, a, a little too much of that. So if you've got something this complex and tightly coupled on the left, you can end up with just uh, the same sort of tight coupling uh, and complexity on the right with as many microservices. So here's a, a snapshot um, of one of the UK's fintechs and there, uh, I think it's around 4,000 microservices for a company that employs um, about 400 technologists. This doesn't necessarily feel optimal. Uh, and of course, you can't, even if you are going to do this with some legacy systems, you can't do it overnight. Um, the pattern is, is evolutionary architecture using things like the Strangler Fig pattern. And so uh, we do have something or did have something that looked a lot like this at Taxa Bank. And where we are now is, well, we're, we're slowly taking some of the services into, into more modular teams and modular uh, services and, and that journey will continue. It'll continue for, for years, probably for the next decade. 
And uh, this this about uh, complexity, this quote, which is not an architectural one, it's just about co complexity in business, but this is uh, particularly important in, uh, in software architecture where I work. Um, and it says that uh, complexity, creating and reducing, it might feel, it might sound like these are just symmetrical things. You create some complexity and you can take it away you know, just as easily, but you can't. There are, there are fundamental asymmetries because creating complexity can be quite cheap. Um, tightly coupling two systems together it can be as simple as just putting a, a, a call between the two of them. And then the business becomes dependent on that and taking it away is, is expensive. So if you want to avoid that complexity in the first place, if you want to try and keep your business and your architecture and your organization simple, then, well, can you use architecture governance for that? Again, this traditional enterprise architecture has this approach of architecture review boards, which sort of works in old ways of working. You have initiate, plan, execute and close as a project plan and the symmetrical software design the waterfall activities where at the end of an analysis phase, you can put an architecture board in and then they can review something even more detailed at the end of a design phase. But modern delivery does not have a design phase. Design is something that is continuous. This is something Martin Fowler wrote about about 20 years ago in the Is Design Dead article, and releasing happens often, and this is awesome for businesses because they get value early and often, but where does the architecture board live? In this style of working, well, you can't really, you don't have any single point of a single design to review. And certainly when you move to uh, DevOps and Infinity Loop way of working, the architecture board has, has no place to say, great, stop, tell me your design. So the pattern, again, the contrast to the anti-pattern there is, well, what you want to govern is not designs on paper. It, it's architectures as as they are happening, architecting, designing as it's happening. So for us in Saxo, uh, a few things that we govern as an architecture function. People who want to add a new service to the landscape, well, that's adding complexity. So we talk to them. We say, why? Is there something you could do in an existing service um, which would make life less complex rather than more? And sometimes it is, but often it isn't. And so that's fine. Um, again, coupling between services or even calling even asynchronous calling between services, even relatively loose coupling between services is still adding complexity. So we need to just check, is that, is that really the right thing to do? Is there another way to do this? Is there a, another way to achieve this end, uh, to keep some things more simple? So we can do that. We, we actually approve connections between services, again, rather than uh, here's a design on paper that we're going to implement in 18 months' time. Uh, and the same with uh, tight coupling rather than loose coupling and synchronous coupling rather than, rather than asynchronous. So again, the other pattern here, in contrast to that anti-pattern of one-off, upfront, phase-based uh, architecture reviews is continuous conversations. Most of the modern processes, most of the modern ways of working, agile, lean, DevOps, continuous delivery, and continuous delivery is very explicit about it. These are continuous processes rather than phase-based ones. So here, we have conversations as an architecture function. We talk to people, we, we coach them in better design, in, in less complex, in more simple design, in, in, um, uh, in making decisions that are, are balanced. And we don't just do this as an ivory tower function from on high, we get an architecture community of practice, which is made up of architects throughout the organization, not just in a centralized function, and lead designers who might want to grow up to be an architect. And we have this community and they take part in the conversations as well. So that works extremely well in uh, either agile projects or as we move from project to product, uh, it works well too because this continuous conversation continues around the infinity loop. And that conversational governance doesn't just work for single teams, it works for teams of teams. Um, and it works again with this center of excellence, the, the centralized function combining with, uh, with the community. And effectively what we're doing, we are doing DevOps um, and we're going around that infinity loop at a bigger scale uh, at a team of teams and team of team of teams scale at enterprise scope. And just thinking that a bit longer term than the next quarter or the next weeks or the next uh, few months delivery. We work closely with service management because traditionally architecture has been on the left, on the dev side of the loop. But of course, the ops side of the loop is as important, probably more important. Um, and again, 
we're going across value streams, across teams of teams, and up to the enterprise level, hence the name enterprise architecture. That, that's really what we're doing is working at all levels of the organization. Gregor Hopi has some uh, great writing on that in the uh, Architect Elevator. So finally, to conclude, this approach to modern enterprise architecture, um, there's a contrast to old ways of working and old enterprise architecture, traditional ways of working. So we look at ABCD, aligning value, people, and technology using things like Commons Law, team topologies, and others, rather than just these bilateral agreements of trying to uh, align just tech to value or just people to value. It's, it's all three. Better value, sooner, safer, happier. Those balanced outcomes we talked about rather than those old outcomes of deduplication, standardization, cost reduction, continuous conversational governance rather than the phase gated one, DevOps at enterprise scale rather than architects just being to the left and just on looking at change or dev or project. And finally, that evolutionary enterprise architecture, understanding that, that you're not going to get perfection tomorrow, that everything has to evolve over time, um, uh, rather than there's just big bang improvements, everything uh, deteriorates for a while. And then once every three years, we've got a big architecture program to, to fix it all. That, that's never going to work. Thank you so much. <laughs>